Transcriptomics 3 is a course dedicated to advanced methods of analysis that will allow us to find meaningful patterns in data, especially complex patterns that are present in big data sets. In this video, we will turn our attention to supervised machine learning, classification, and feature selection. In the Transcriptomics 3 course, we are learning about machine learning for transcriptomic data. As we've already discussed, machine learning can be separated into two main categories of methods. The first of which is unsupervised machine learning, which focuses on the detection of patterns in data. The main idea here is to apply techniques that are automated and rely on various assumptions about data in order to learn from it. The second main category is supervised machine learning. These methods rely on the availability of training data, which has been labeled. Once a data set of labeled data has been accumulated, it can be used to train a model that will be able to apply this knowledge to analyze new data, for example, by predicting its class. Large RNA-seq data collections provide us with the opportunity to discover signals in gene expression that might not be apparent with smaller sample sizes, such as prognostic indicators or predictive factors. This is especially the case for subsets of patients. However, discerning this signal in such large datasets frequently relies on the application of machine learning algorithms to identify relationships in high-dimensional data, or to cope with computational complexities. These approaches often construct a model that capture relevant features of a dataset. The model can be used to make predictions about new data such as how well a patient will respond to a particular treatment, or whether their cancer is likely to recur. Therefore, the model is usually constructed using a large and diverse data set, which will then be applied to incoming cases to make predictions about them. In this video, we're going to be learning about such methods that will explain how classification, as well as feature selection, works. Supervised machine learning takes place in data that has to be labeled, and typically this is done by people. In biomedical projects, this could be clinical data or some other type of phenotypic data. This labeled data is used to train a model, and the model will be tested on a test data set. This data set will include examples of what is in the training data. The methods vary, as do the principles that we'll be using to build the model, but for now, we can refer to them as a black box. The method will essentially learn from the differences between various classes that are present in the training data set. Once the learning has been established, you'll have a model, or a template that can be applied to new data sets. New data will have to be assigned with a class that is present in the training data set, so if something doesn't fit, such as the stars on the bottom right of this screen, model accuracy will be reduced. The output of a classification algorithm includes predicted classes for each object, or sample that's found in the data. Some algorithms, such as Random Forest, also evaluate how accurate and stable the prediction is, evaluating which features, if taken out, will be the most significant for the accuracy of the prediction. To illustrate this concept simply, we can look at the classification of images. We train the model by showing it images of cats and dogs and then testing that prediction on other variations of cat and dog images. But instead of cats and dogs, we have gene expression. To train the model, we'll have to label the data by using phenotypic information, such as cancer stage or subtype of risk factor. In the training data, we will have a special row that we will call class, and it will contain labels for each of the samples. Genes in the machine learning language are going to be called features, and samples are called objects. The test dataset will not have the class row. It will only contain genes, sample names, as well as levels of expression. One such algorithm is called binary decision trees. Their output looks similar to hierarchical clustering, with each tree being created by thresholds and rules. Binary means the branch can either be yes or no. If the expression of a genes is higher than x, 
the classes will separate. The algorithm will continue until it has effectively separated all of the samples into some group. If we use less genes in the training dataset, we will get different results because the dataset can be dealt with differently. Also, binary decision trees are initiated with random start, so the genes selected in this procedure can change from time to time. Here we see the cell line data separated into three groups, luminal, basal, and cloud and low with two genes. Random Forest uses multiple instances of these decision trees that are applied to portions of the data one at a time. After the analysis, the tree predictions are analyzed and majority voting is accepted. The algorithm is useful for more complex patterns where smoother borders between classes are needed. It also gives an output of most significant features for classification. Linear Discriminant Analysis, or LDA, is a generalization of Fisher's linear discriminant, which is a method that's used in statistics, pattern recognition, and machine learning. This method is used to find a linear combination of features that characterize or separate two or more classes of objects or events. The resulting combination may be used as a classifier or for dimensionality reduction before later types of classification. LDA is closely related to analysis of variance as well as regression analysis, which also attempt to express one dependent variable as a linear combination of other features or measurements. However, analysis of variance uses categorical independent variables and a continuous dependent variable, whereas discriminant analysis has continuous independent variables and a categorical dependent variable. LDA is also closely related to principal component analysis, which is also called PCA, as well as factor regression analysis, and that they both look for the linear combinations of variables, which best explain the data. By contrast, PCA does not take into account any of the differences in class, and factor analysis builds the feature combinations based on differences rather than the similarities. What's important to remember here is that LDA assumes that the data is normally distributed within each class, so preparing the data before running the analysis is going to be essential. Stepwise LDA makes it possible to automatically select those features in your data that are most useful or most relevant for the problem that you're working on. This is a process called feature selection. Feature selection is different from dimensionality reduction. Although both methods seek to reduce the number of attributes in the data set, a dimensionality reduction method does so by creating new combinations of attributes. Feature selection methods include as well as exclude the attributes that are present in the data without actually changing them. Stepwise linear discriminant analysis is used to find a subset of the provided features that optimally separate the classes that are inherent in the data. In this procedure, a discriminant model is built iteratively. Starting with an empty set of features, LDA classification is evaluated on each feature and the feature resulting in the highest accuracy is added to the optimal feature set. Other features are added to the set in the order of maximum improvement of accuracy until no significant improvement is provided by further features. This is called a forward selection procedure, where one adds features to the model one at a time. At each step, each feature that is not already in the model is tested for inclusion in the model. The most significant of these features is added to the model so long as its p-value is below some of the preset levels. For instance, this could be 0.05. This cutoff threshold is set by the Niveau parameter. The input files are going to be the same as for the LDA pipeline. For our expression data, which contain expression levels for almost 7,000 genes, we set this value to be 0.0005. In the results of the pipeline, we found that it selected just nine genes, but they provided a perfect classification for the training set. Another important method we will talk about is support vector machines. This algorithm differs from other classification methods because it is optimal to find the boundary of a class and uses a feature space transformation with a kernel function that makes separation more efficient. For example, a circular class border can be achieved by a straight hyperplane 
if the space was curved in such a way that the classes are cut by it with a decision surface. The original SVM algorithm was invented by Vladimir Vapnik and Alexei Shavonikis in 1963. Vapnik suggested a way to create nonlinear classifiers by applying the kernel trick to a maximum margin hyperplane. The current standard incarnation of SVM using soft margins was proposed by Corinna Cortez and Vapnik in 1993 and published in 1995. This idea of support vector machines is to map the training data into a higher dimensional space feature via phi and construct a separating hyperplane with maximum margin there. This trick helps to find efficient ways of separating classes while dealing with messy data that cannot be separated by linear boundaries. As a result, the transformation creates a new function for distance in the new space. An SVM model is a representation of the examples as points in space, and they're mapped so that the examples of the separate categories are divided by a clear gap that is as wide as possible. New examples are then going to be mapped into some space and predicted to belong to a category based on which side of the gap they fall. During this prediction stage, the SVM algorithm will measure distance of a new object in the kernel space to the nearest representative in the training data. SVM stands for Support Vector Machine. This is an efficient classifier that can deal with complex separation between classes. However, it can have trouble working with too many features. The input is train and test data, and the output is a predicted class with accurate results for a prediction. There are many considerations that should be made for supervised analysis. First, we should fit our classifier on a training set and predict the classes on the test set. We also have to determine if it's possible to tune 7,000 coefficients by 52 samples. Some of the algorithms do feature selection, such as SWLDA and Random Forest. However, other algorithms won't work if the number of features is in great excess to the number of samples. And then there's the curse of dimensionality. These methods are commonly used in a variety of biomedical research, as well as clinical projects where large data sets are beginning to be more and more available. These include patient stratification, disease classification and diagnostics, identification of potential responders to therapies, mechanisms of disease onset and progression, and then on the pharma biotech side, there's biomarker discovery, detection of toxicity at the in vitro stage, the analysis of molecular mechanisms of drug action, which is also known as target discovery, and then drug repurposing and repositioning. 